Galatians, uh, it's really the first uh, three verses, but the second part of uh, to, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when I was a tiny boy, we didn't have a television. Uh, my father was a very godly man. He just gave our money away. Uh, it wasn't that we were poor. He just made sure we were poor because he was always giving our, our money away and, uh, and helping churches. And we didn't have a TV. All my friends, we were the last. And I remember watching a TV show, and uh, it was a news program, and it was about an American supermarket that wanted to publicize itself. So its top 10 customers, they did a deal. It's one of the first things I've seen on television. And the deal was, is you would have a supermarket basket, and you would have two minutes, and it was one of these huge ones, you know, like Tesco's Extra, uh, one of these massive, you know, do you have Tesco's up here? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. all right then, Aldi's, no, not Aldi's, bigger than Aldi's, one of these five or six Aldi's, and uh, one of these huge ones, TVs, electrical, you know, sort of John Lewis, if you're really posh, one of those, and you go in, and you've got two minutes with the suit, uh, with a basket uh, on, a, on a trolley, and you can put whatever you like in it, but uh, you've got to be back at the till after two minutes, you're, if you, even if you've got a full basket, if you're not back at the till, you get nothing. Can you imagine what you'd do if you did that? So people would go into the electrical section, and uh, one man, he filled it up with uh, and TVs in those days, huge TV, and a, and a huge everything you get, but he didn't make it back. He got nothing. Everybody else, you saw them jumping into the freezer, one man sort of emptying it all in, going crazy. He got back, full trolley. What's church like? Why do you go? That's why you go. Some people say you go to worship God. I, I don't think that's true. I don't think we're capable of worshiping God. I don't think any of you are. We're all sinners. You can't worship God. Some people say, purpose of life is to glorify God. But you can't glorify God because you're a sinner. And you can try as hard as you can, but you can't. You just can't. So why do you go? Why do you go to church? What is the purpose? And it is to receive grace and peace. Martin Luther brilliantly put it like this. He said, we go to church with an empty bag. <laughs> That's how you go to church. You go with a bag and you say, I have an empty bag. God, fill this bag. Or another way, thing that Luther said, last thing that Martin Luther said, there's a little note in his pocket after he died. Somebody described, uh, went through his pockets, and this is all it said. It's an amazing thing. He carried it, obviously carried it with, with him everywhere he went. This was the line. Martin Luther, maybe the greatest Christian since Paul, said this. We are all beggars. Every time he thought of the great things he did, go in his little pocket. We are all beggars beggars. Now I want us to look at the book of Galatians and we're going to just try and look at that introduction and we're going to see that. I want you to first of all see what is the church at Galatia like. Well it's summed up in verse 3. You stupid Galatians, you have been bewitched. What kind of church is the church at Galatia? It's just like the church at Nidri. It is full of people like you. What are the churches? Because churches copy each other. It is full of people like you. What are those people like? Stupid. Stupid. And satanically lied to. You say, whoa, whoa, that's a bit strong. But the truth of the matter is, if everybody knew your heart, and what you've done this week, not last week, not before you were a Christian, just this week, or if you're not a Christian, just this week, think about the things you've done. Think about the times you got annoyed with somebody else because they didn't realize that the whole world circles around you. Think of the times that you sulked because somebody didn't realize that you actually aren't the center of the universe. 
I found this this week. I, I found myself shouting. I was driving down to church and I was late. It was my fault, totally my fault. I was late uh, to church. I had a meeting and a car pulled up. Have you ever had this when you're driving? Out of a junction and it just pulled out really slowly and cut me up. And then decided that they would drive, no, they're not kidding, 15 miles an hour. I was livid. Don't they know who I am? Don't you know I've got somewhere to go? Doesn't matter you're old and disabled, you're in my way. <laughs> I was trying everything in me, I was trying not to toot, I was shouting. If I could have got my hands on, if I had a gun, I could shoot them and I could drive. <laughs> you know, all of this, why, where does that come from? Stupid views of me. I think there is a God and I think it's me. Stupid, satanic lies I believe about myself. And this letter is written to the churches here, but it's also written to your church. And it's written by a God who knows everything you've said and everything you've done this week, and everything you said and everything you've done every time you come to church, every Sunday, every hypocrisy. Do you do that when you come in? And you've, you've committed all kinds of sins in the week, but you shake everyone's hand and say, I love you. You know, in your church, you do, you're into hugging. Creeps me out a little. I'm, uh, I was very glad to hear what uh, Mayor said about the non-binary thing. I was a little unsure, if I'm honest, but, I, uh, <laughs> but I'm all right now. That makes me just watch what you're doing with your hands when you hug me. But I, uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> you know, the times you've done that and all the times you know that that week you've thought terrible things about the person you've hugged. And you've thought terrible lies about them. And you've borne terrible grudges, and you just hugged them anyway and smiled and, and sang with them, smiling about Jesus dying for you. But you think you're better than them. And you think the church would be better off without them. And you think the church would be a better place if everybody would listen to you. Stupid and foolish. So what does the Bible say? I love this. First verse, Paul, an apostle. Paul sent, not from men, not by man, but Jesus Christ, God the Father. What an incredible thing here is even though they're stupid, and even though they're satanic, all three persons of the Trinity have got something to say to every member of these churches. And they have something to say to you. God knows your heart. He knows what you've done. And amazingly, He sends an apostle for you, not just Jesus, it is Jesus, but Jesus the Christ, the one anointed with the Spirit, and the Father. All three persons literally say, I want a word with you. I haven't blanked you. I know, I know, I know you're bewitched. I know about the satanic stuff. I know you're stupid. I know you're stupid, but I still want to talk to you. I'm gonna, still going to send an apostle to speak to you. It's not men. It's not none of that nonsense. Let's just cut out that rubbish. It's not men and it's not by a man. This is actually the triune God through Jesus Christ wants to talk to stupid, satanically fooled Christians. That blows my mind, doesn't it? If I was God, I'd blank me. In fact, that's what I think of God. That's why sometimes I don't listen in sermons because I don't think God's got anything to say to me because of the way I've been. People often say that. God's finished with me. I said, there's only one way we know God's finished with you and it's when we're burying you. God hasn't finished with you. If you're breathing, he hasn't finished with you. He, he, he wants a word. Jesus, the sent, the apostle. Jesus, the Christ, the one anointed with the Spirit. Jesus, the one sent by the Father. The three persons of the Trinity still want to talk to you, however much of a mess your life is. And everybody's like, I'm not bad, I'm stupid, I'm bewitched. I'm not better than anyone. I know my heart. I'm a sinner. And yet he still wants to talk to me and you. And he wants to talk to Nidri and Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And I love this little phrase. Raise him from the dead. See, as stupid as you are and as satanic as you've been, what justifies you is not 
your holiness. It's not your quiet times. It's not how you sing. It's not how friendly you are in church. It's not how much you smile. It's not how much you serve. It's not how much you give. It's not how much you know. Christ was raised for your justification. You know, you'd be closer to God if you read the Bible. No, you won't. You won't. You'd be closer to God if you prayed more. No, you won't. No, you won't. You cannot get closer to God than the moment you're saved. He is raised for your justification. You have been stupid. You have been satanic. He still pleads your name in heaven. And he wants a word. He wants to deal with that stuff. But before he deals with that stuff, he wants a word and he wants to tell you Christ died for your sins. And more than that, was raised for your justification. You don't have to say to God, God, you know, from now on, when I was first a Christian, I was always promising to start tithing. That was my big prayer. Lord, if you let me pass this exam that I haven't studied for, I used to pray that. Lord, I'm going to start tithing my pocket money. You know I will. Dad gives me 10 pence because he gives all the money to missionaries or something like that. And he only gives me 10 pence. Even the tooth fairy, five pence from the tooth fairy. I had the tightest tooth fairy ever. <laughs> And, and God used to give half, used to have half pence. I, that's why I put that in collection. That was my tithe. Half pence. Because <laughs> I, you know, God, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you everything. I'll give you, an, and then I'll be right with you. You're right with God because Jesus is risen from the dead. Wait, bewitched, stupid Christians. You're right with God because Jesus was raised from the dead. God wants a word. God wants a word. I don't know whether, do you ever have this uh, with Andy or maybe Mess is there? Uh, send someone and someone comes on to you. In our church, this, this happens all the time. I say, oh, you couldn't grab so-and-so. I don't know where, uh, Katie. Could you grab Katie? And uh, uh, I need to have a chat. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, somebody will say, oh, Steve wants a chat. And uh, I'll sit down with Katie and I'll, I'll say, hey, Katie, uh, I was wondering, uh, any chance of you going on the coffee road? <sighs> I thought I'd done something wrong. Do you know my pastoral study, they call it, the, this is what they call my pastoral study, the room of doom and the chair of despair. That's what they call my, people say, Steve has asked me to the room of doom, to the chair, and, to, uh, and, and now I'm going to sit in the chair of despair. Let me, I love the way you're all doing this. The, the point of the illustration is the other way around on this. That's right. <laughs> well, you can't eat it. He just eats it, enjoying it. But listen, this is really important. You've got to understand this. When God wants a word with you, and he knows you've been stupid, and he knows you've been satanic, and he's going to talk to you about that, what's he going to say first? He knows what you've said, and he knows what you've done. What's he going to say first? My dad, and my dad is, my dad is fearfully uh, but not wonderfully made. My father is still the most terrifying man I know. Uh, my father, I'll tell you a story about my father. Me, I've got three brothers, and one is six foot three, and he's, uh, he's just an animal. He's just a monstrous uh, guy, and he's sort of fearful and nothing. And I've got another brother who's just basically a comedian. You know that, because he's a Presbyterian. But he's, uh, he's, uh, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's, sorry, if you don't know, get that. It's a little religious joke. It's funny when you get, well, it's not that funny. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he's, uh, he's, he actually is the funniest guy you know. My father's got this long little quiff of hair on the top of his head, right? And uh, it looks ridiculous. But my father's so frightening, nobody laughs at him, right? So uh, my, my dad once was shitting, was getting into the car, and the three of us, three of us are there, we all like a good laugh, and, uh, and he shut the door, and his hair got caught in the door. <laughs> Slammed the door, right? And he, he pulled it, and, and you could see his face grimace. And then he opened the door, and he put his hair, he drove around. None of us laughed till he drove around the corner. <laughs> I want that kind of respect for my children. <laughs> That's the kind of, you know, he's that kind of guy. He's like, he genuinely, he's, he's that kind of man, right? And, uh, and, but he does this for the grandchildren. He says, uh, I want to talk to you, but before I want to talk to you, I, I got something for you. I don't know, he's gone soft since he's become a grandfather. Uh, we never had chocolates, but anyway. <laughs> and he put his hand in his pocket and, and he'd get out sort of a handful of chocolates. 
God wants to get, have a word with you. Jesus Christ, the one anointed with the Spirit, the Son of God, wants a word with you. And he's been risen and he's put you right, but he still wants a word with you. Look at the text. Can you see it in verse 3? Before I have a word, I want to give you everything. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give you everything. Before he deals with your sin, and he must deal with your sin. Before he deals with your bad theology, and he must deal with your bad theology. Before he makes you the church in the dream that he's called you to be. He says, before we deal, and he's going to deal with it. He's going to say, look, you're stupid, you're satanic, you know, you're a mess. You're really worse than a mess. You're just terrible. You know, you're more, doing more harm than good. That's what basically he's going to say later on. But he says, before you, let me, I've got something for you. Everything. Everything. When you come to church, you don't come and say, God, I want to give you something. You say, God, I've got an empty trolley. And you're going to have to fill it. You don't come to church and say, you know, I want to use my gifts and I want to use my strengths. Gifts always come later in the letters than this. You don't say, I, I, I want to do something. I, I'm going to worship you. And God's going, oh, I love that because I'm so important. He, that's not how he looks at himself. That's not, I mean, what the fail that is. You know, oh, I'm really special. The first thing God always does is give. And he gives. And he gives. And he gives. And he wants to give you two things. And then I want us to see how he gives them. And I want to see, uh, finally, who exactly gives these things. The first thing he wants to give you is grace. Grace. It's the favorite prayer in the Bible. Help me. But it's help you don't deserve. That's what it is, grace, really. That sums it up. There is the grace which brings salvation, but the word really is help you don't deserve. He wants to help you. God wants to help you. He wants to give you more grace, as Aim says, when the burdens grow greater. He wants to help you. Whatever it is you're in, he wants to give you help. You don't earn it. It's not grace you deserve. It's not something you earn. He wants to help you with your sin, with your marriage, with your work situation, whether you're working or not, with your addiction. He wants to help you. And there's more help from them, him than there are problems in you. There's more strength and power in him than there is strength in you. I used to go to um, the gym with Paul James. Do you know the rugby player? He plays for the British Lions, Paul James. His, uh, his father came to our church. His father left his mum. It was a uh, and I said, why are you not allowed to see your boys? I reintroduced them, actually. I said, why are you not allowed to see your boys? I said, did you hit her? No, I'd never hit her. I'd never hit her. It's my wife, Steve, you know me, I'd never hit her. I said, you've been in prison? Yeah, but I'd never hit a woman. Never hit a woman. I said, so why, why are you not allowed to see the boys? He said, well, we had an argument once. And uh, I said, yeah, but that can't be it. Yeah, it, it, it got a bit difficult. Well, what happened? He said, I picked up the sofa and threw it out the window. I said, that would do it. <laughs> That's quite impressive, isn't it? Picking up a sofa. Well, I, I wanted to witness to him, so I said, what do you like? Well, in, in jail, I was in the gym. Do you want to... I said, oh, I'll go to the gym. I'd never been to the gym in my life. <laughs> so I, uh, I, he did some weights. And he goes, you have a go. I said, oh, I've never done it before. He said, no, I'll be all right. So bench press. And he... Uh, he said, no, lift it. So I, I just about lifted it, oof, right onto my chest. He goes, oh, I, di I didn't like it for you. So I was literally like that. And I thought, I'm and my ribs are going to break now. And then he stretched over and he pulled it up and carried it for me. I thought, I, I, and that's grace. Life is too heavy for everybody because you're sinners and you're stupid. So Jesus stretches over while your chest is being crushed and your heart is being broken. And he picks up the weights. He has more grace than you have sin. He has more grace than you have problems. And I know you've been stupid. And I've been stupid. I know we followed Satan. We have. 
We believed all kinds of wicked lies. But he wants to help you. You come to church with your empty trolley every Sunday because it's given to churches. And you say, God, you've got to fill this trolley for me. You've got to stand outside church and you've got to be just like it was in the Bible. You're a blind, desperate beggar and you come to church. Before you worship, before you praise, before you serve, you come and he wants to serve you. Second thing is peace. He gives you. That's the second thing that's mentioned. Maybe the bigger thing, isn't it? It's peace. Life is like, I hear this phrase. I don't know whether you say it here, but it's a Swansea line. The word hell is used, I think, probably than any other word. There's a word that goes before hell you hear a lot, but the word hell. My marriage is like my hell. My head's in hell. It's like hell inside. Every time I go to bed, it's like hell. I, can't, I don't know how to bring any peace to this chaos. That's what he really is saying. Is this sense of turmoil inside of me. This chaos. It's like the ocean outside. It's, a, it's like it's pushed around. And, and I can't calm it. I can't still it. I tried with drugs. I tried with, with sex. I tried with religion. I tried with being good. But in the end, it just comes up like a massive wave inside of me. And the second thing he offers on a Sunday is peace. It's not like the world gives. It's a peace the world can't understand. Jesus died to give you peace inside. And Jesus died to give you peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with the world, peace with your future, peace with your past. And he wants to settle your heart. He wants to calm you down. We're all like little children, aren't we? And you see the little children. When mum's gone. What are little children like? They're like all of us, aren't they? <laughs> you know, you, somebody goes up to them. <laughs> somebody else goes up to them. <laughs> and they're just screaming. And they're absolutely nothing. is going to calm them. No, you don't do that. But, you are, <laughs> but it, it's chaos, isn't it? It's like, ah, absolute mayhem. And then mum comes. And all is well. Isn't that a picture of what God wants to do in you? Aren't you like that little child screaming and somebody says, what about this? Screaming. What about this? Screaming. And then Christ comes and says, be still on the abyss. I love that story, don't you? It's, it's hell. The sea in the Bible is hell. And Jesus Jesus comes and they're like, don't you care? It's like they're all, don't you? Like little kids. Like, don't you care? He just gets up. And rebukes hell. Because that's what he does. He holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You think your hell is too great for you? Of course it's too great for you. So come and get grace and peace from Jesus Christ. And there are means that these come. That's the second thing, isn't it? There's means of grace and peace. What are the means of grace and peace? Church, that's what church is about, isn't it? When you come to church. Hasn't that happened to you when you've been welcomed in church? Have you found that? You felt that everybody hates you, don't you? God hates you. Your family hates you. Everybody hates you. No, and it's only you know with your sin. And then you walk in church and, and somebody greets you and they're greeting you. They don't say the words, but they greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a means of grace to you. And then a song is struck up and you feel helpless and hopeless. And you sing to one another. And grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ comes to you through the singing of a song or through someone sharing a verse. Or you come and you feel your sins aren't forgiven and you come to the Lord's table and then somebody says, it is given for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what it's about. Or you see a baptism and you remember you died with Christ and you were buried with Christ and you're raised with Christ and grace and peace come to you. Or the word is opened up in a sermon. And nothing you feel can help you. And then God uses the means of preaching of God's word to you to bring grace and peace. 
That's why the devil wants to do everything to stop you coming to church. It always makes me laugh. People say, uh, and we'll look at this later in the week, uh, I can't come to church because of what I've done wrong this week. Church is only for people who do wrong things. You've got to get your head into this. Well, I'm going to give this quote later in the sermon. Jesus only came for sinners. Martin Luther said, so you better make sure you're a sinner. I think that's a really helpful thing, isn't it? You better make sure you're a sinner. So I can't come, I've sinned. Great! <laughs> if you come and say, well, I haven't sinned this week, you know, so I'm coming. It's like, no, oh, no, probably best not to come. He's only for sinners. He's only for sinners. Grace and peace to you. God our Father, what are the means of grace? The preaching, well, church, preaching of His Word, baptism, Lord's Supper. Do you just sit there and you just, you just sit there and you think, oh, well, just somebody's doing the thing? It's supposed to be a means to help you. You're supposed to think, get something out of that. You remember your baptism when you see a baptism. You remember your forgiveness of sins when you eat and drink. You're supposed to listen to the songs and let others sing to you and then you sing to them. And you're supposed to listen to God's word and let him bring grace and peace to your soul. And then the last thing. And I love this. Who brings it? Who can do such a thing? All three persons of the Trinity. God, I love this. Our Father, I love that. God's as much your Father if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Apostle Paul. That's cool, isn't it? I'll, I'll go further than that bewitched, stupid Christian. He's as much your father as he is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's incredible, isn't it? And he wants to help you and give you peace. He wants to fill your trolley with grace and peace so that you can go out this week and when someone's horrible to you, you go into the trolley and you get some grace and you remember... If he's forgiven you, you forgive them. And, and we could, you, that's another thing. You just endlessly go back into what you received on Sunday and you live it out throughout the week. And then you go to church the next week with your empty trolley and you say, fill me up, God, because i got to go out next week and I live with idiots and I need lots of grace and I need lots of peace. And that's how you go to church. And you turn up early and you leave late and you milk every Christian for all the grace and peace they got. Have you got a verse for me? Have you read anything? Could you pray for me? Go through the sermon again with me. I need grace because I live with idiots. And I, I live in the world and it's really hard for me. So I need grace and peace. Lots of it. But it comes from God our Father. It comes from Jesus. Grace and peace. And it comes from the Holy Spirit who anoints Jesus. Can you see all three persons of the Trinity are rooting for you and want to help you? All three persons of the Trinity want to help you with your problems where you need help. I don't know what your problem is. Maybe your problem is you're lonely. Maybe your problem is you're bitter or you're angry. Maybe your problem is, I don't know what your problem is. But however big it is, His grace and peace is more. But all three persons of the Trinity want to personally help you. This is the most incredible thing in the world. They don't only want a word with you. Through Jesus, the Father sends Jesus in the power of the Spirit, and he wants a word, and he's risen from the dead. So you're justified, so let's sort that out. Now he wants to actually help you now with your marriage, and he wants to help you with your bitterness, and he wants to help you with your job, and he wants to help you with your with whatever it is, and he wants to bring peace to the case. All three persons of the Trinity love you and want to help you. It's not just Jesus, all three of them, the Father, our Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who anointed Jesus without measure, are not only just rooting for you, but actually actively wanting to help you. And to be honest with you, your problems are so big that you need the Trinity to help you. I'll close with this because I think everybody's a little tired. But I um, had a horrendous year last year. I uh, Two days, really, passed as a nightmare. I had a girl who worked with me, a young woman. She got married, and uh, she, was, she was just amazing. Uh, but when she got married, uh, she got pregnant. And while she was working for me, uh, and she was pregnant, a little boy was born prematurely. Boaz, his name is, a little boy. And, um, and uh, 24. Three or 24 weeks, and even though nearly all the doctors on her ward were from our church, 
uh, and nurses. It's touch and go at that stage. He looked like he was going to recover, but uh, little Boaz had a massive stroke, and I was called in to see whether he was going to die. Ah, and I was to pray with him. That was why they let me into the ward. And her husband was just amazing. He stood with me. I was a mess, and he just stood next to me. And uh, it was a really bizarre situation. I was supposed to be praying for him, and he was going, look, it's all right. I trust God, and we trust. And he was just incredible, the dad was. And the dad, uh, and I prayed. And then uh, about, uh, well, last year, uh, on a Thursday, I had a phone call. He'd, he'd been ill, and it turns out that he'd been ill, and the doctors in Swansea had missed it because they were rubbish doctors, and uh, he had terminal cancer. I made a phone call on a Thursday night telling me he was going to die. But he was at peace with God. I wasn't at peace about it, but he was at peace with God. And uh, his great line was, he said, well, if I can trust God with my soul, I can trust him with my wife and my child. That's quite powerful, isn't it? He said that to me. And I got off the phone. I was a bit of a mess. Eight o'clock the next morning, I had a phone call from Nigeria. And uh, it was one of my, uh, it was the daughter of one of uh, my former elders, the guy who stepped down, uh, just pressure of work had got to him, but uh, that's not why the phone call came. The phone call came and they said, and I'd seen Franz on the Sunday, and the phone call came from Nigeria, because my, uh, I just want to tell you, my dad suddenly died this morning. He was a hospital consultant in the hospital. And it turns out again that the hospital hadn't checked on him, and if they had, he would have been okay, but they hadn't, and he was dead. You can imagine, I went to the ward, and I was, uh, it was casualty in Swansea, of all places, and, uh, and uh, as I, I, he was uh, lying there, and his wife was next to him, and I prayed, and I, and I thought, well, I ought to stay here, and if you know anything about uh, uh, Zimbabwe culture, when they see somebody who dies, they scream, so this is Swansea uh, casualty unit, and then there's a group of Africans come in, and I'm sitting in the room thinking, what am I going to say? And all they're doing is, no, screaming. And, I'm, and the nurse puts her head around the door, says, could you sort this out? And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. My head's in the shed about my friend and his wife and his little son. My head's gone because the guy just died, and he was there Sunday, and and I was in the room, and she was, at that point, this group of uh, people had been rushed out, and she was just there in the room on her own with him. And I'm literally going through my head. It's funny, stupid thing. What passage of the Bible is going to help her? Have you ever done that? What passage? And I literally, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, 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 there is no passage in the Bible that is of any use at this time. It's none. What am I going to read that's not going to sound like I don't care? And I'm literally sitting there, and it's one of the elders' wives, and she's, she's sitting there, and we're just in silence. And then a voice comes from the room next door, Beatrice, singing, Jesus, 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 Father, 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 Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. I remember sitting there thinking, that's it! God's God! God's God! Jesus Christ is going to hold her. And the Father is hidden. Christ is hidden in God. And the Spirit is given life. I don't have to look after this situation. The triune God has got her. That's the gospel for you. Whatever you go through in life, God's got you. Jesus has got you. And he wants to give you grace. And he wants to give you peace. And the Father has got you, and he wants to give you grace, and he wants to give you peace. And the Spirit has got you, and he wants to give you grace. And he wants to give you peace. And it's okay. Because there's more grace and peace in the triune God than there is in you. Your chaos and your mess are not too big for him. Your sin, even your satanic sin, 
is not bigger than his grace and peace for you. I thought I'd end with a silly story. There's a, there's a minister in Northern Ireland, one of the biggest churches in Europe. And he never took a holiday and he prayed this prayer. He said, uh, he took a holiday, everyone told him he had to, and he got on his knees and he said, Lord, look after the church while I'm on holiday. And being a Pentecostal pastor, the, the Lord spoke back and the Lord said to him this, who do you think looks after it while you're there? <laughs> Who's looked after you so far? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Who's going to look after you now? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Who loves you? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Who wants to talk to you? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity want to help you. Stupid, satanic Christian. (laughs) I love that, don't you? stupid, satanic Christian, all three persons say, come to church with an empty trolley and let me fill it with grace and peace. That is the beginning of the book of Galatians.